I looked at myself as if I wasn't myself. And I, and I almost said, oh, you poor girl. No wonder you're tired. No wonder you feel alone. If you have a relationship with someone and, and one of those two people is not healthy, then the relationship is not healthy. When one of us is cut, all of us bleed. And welcome to another day in love. I am your host, Shanae. Thank you so much for being here. I was raised to reverence and respect my elders. I was raised with the understanding that the older generation has so much wisdom and knowledge that they can impart on us if we are humble enough to learn. So with that said, I am starting this series where I invite individuals or couples from older generations to come on here and share with us their lived experiences, their stories, so that we can learn and maybe avoid some of the mistakes that they've made themselves, but also learn from their successes and apply those things to our lives so that we can have marriages and families that are healthy, marriages and families that thrive. So with that said, let's go ahead and meet our very first guest. Today's guest is the lovely Corey Connors. I met Corey probably two-ish years ago. And I must say that Corey and her sisters are by far some of the most down-to-earth, welcoming, I mean, arms open, wide, welcoming people I've ever met. So Corey, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy and so honored to be here. Thanks, Shanae. So Corey, um, where should we start? How about you paint a little picture for us as to what your upbringing was like? Okay. I um, come from a family of seven children, and um, we were all born in Idaho in the U.S. And when I was about five, we moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So we moved from the west to the east, and we were completely removed from all family. So it was, it was, you know, a little isolating in that way. We did have our church, which, you know, provided for us a network that, that uh, kind of represented family to us. Um, my, um, my father was uh, unfortunately addicted to alcohol. And so he um, was not his best self. And so we had some struggles. Um, there were some abuses and there were, um, eventually he abandoned our family. Um, he left by the time I was a young teenager and my mom was left to um, take care of us and uh, herself with no um, financial or emotional help from our father. I, I, I hadn't seen my, I've seen my father once since he left. Um, and he has since passed away. So we have a, you know, we have a good healthy dose of dysfunction in our family. Mm -hmm. And um, frankly, I, I, I don't know that there exists a family without dysfunction on some level. And um, so I, you know, I kind of embrace that that dysfunction. I really think that my dad leaving brought my siblings and my mother closer together. So it, you know, I consider most of life has what I call blurses, which are blessings and curses combined. And so my dad leaving was a blurse, uh, but I, I see evidence of the blessing in, in that. That being said, there were struggles because there were financial struggles. There were emotional struggles. Um, I certainly have a great respect and admiration for our mom. Who, I bet. Who, who was uneducated. Um, and she was very intelligent, but she, you know, married and started having without education. And so she didn't have that a kind of a degree to fall back on or anything. So she ended up building a really great career in real estate and provided well um, once she got rolling for our family. So um, 
my my brothers and sisters and I are very close. We were, I'm so I am so jealous of you guys, you and your sisters. The fact yeah. that one lives here and one lives right over there, and what I would love that for me. You and know, my at one point in our lot, at one point at, as adults, we had all seven kids living in seven different states. We were all over the country, mm -hmm. and then we've just kind of, as we've aged, we've um, migrated to the same field. So our neighborhood has four of four of us, which is so amazing. So the, amazing. Three sisters. It's, it's awesome. We're taking I'm, over. <laughs> I'm jealous, but I'm happy for you guys. I can't help but be happy for you. So what, what fascinates me about your story is that in my mind, you would have people going through, you know, having an alcoholic parent, um, experiencing abuse in the home, experiencing abandonment, and probably saying one day, you know, I, I don't want to do this whole, this marriage thing, right? I don't yeah. want to, I don't want a family of my own. So what was it that made you go, I, I want a marriage, despite the fact that my, my parents' marriage failed, I want a marriage and I want a family. It's, that's, that is interesting. I, um, credit to my mom. She, she did, she didn't talk down our dad. She let him prove himself. Mom always said marriage and family was a healthy thing and it was, mm. it was it was a hopeful and a happy thing. She exposed us on purpose to healthy uh, marital relationships, um, mostly through the people in our church because we have shared value systems. We weren't uh, spat upon by a parent who was bitter against the other parent. Mm -hmm. uh, she didn't throw out how terrible men were or how, you know, how painful marriage was for her, even though we could see it wasn't marriage that was painful. It was the man. She, I never got the feeling that the institution by nature was a bad thing. So um, mostly I wanted love. I think all of us want love um on some level and it depends on our personalities and um, our needs of how we receive that love or or how we give that love um i just didn't question that i wanted love from someone and i wanted to give love to someone it was probably more that i wanted you know it was the child in me that held the madam alexander doll and and I wanted to love someone. And um, so it it didn't feel like I was either seeking it out or avoiding it. It just it just rolled out naturally for me. And, you know, I want to emphasize what your mother did. There may be individuals, especially young people in today's society, looking at their parents relationship and thinking, well, their marriage was terrible. Obviously, marriage is not is not a good thing. But your mother made sure that you guys understood the distinction between marriage as an institution, which is amazing, by the way. It can be a blessing for all the parties involved and the children and society at large. So she made that distinction between the institution of marriage and the individuals involved in marriage, right? right. You have right. to be willing to put in the work to make marriage work. And I think, you know, kudos to her. Job yes. well done. Job right. well done. Right. So now I... Go ahead, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, whether she realized it or not, she was one who really followed her instincts. And um, she, we were very fortunate that her instincts were good and, mm -hmm. and were healthy. You said that you, you wanted love. You wanted to give love. You wanted to receive love. So I love a good love story. So can you tell us how you and your husband met and just bring us back to the beginnings of your relationship? Sure. That, that's fun. I graduated from high school and I was um, prepared to go to Utah, to BYU. I uh, had been accepted there. And summer in our church, um, a young man came back from his mission in Italy. He had served a two-year mission uh, for our church. And um, gosh, he was cute. He was cute. <laughs> he was smart. Um but he was like so much older than me and I, I hadn't dated and I, you know, it just didn't even cross my mind that, um, 
you know, that he could ever look at me, but I could crush on him if I wanted, right? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know. We, it, he was, he was awesome. He was charming, and he was full of of of, of a good spirit and a good light. And um, I just, I thought he was so handsome and and wonderful, and um, but never in my realm. Well, that summer, at the end of the summer, there was a youth, uh, a young adults conference. And I was all of a sudden a young adult. I wasn't like a youth anymore. He asked me if I was going to the young adults conference and I wasn't going to go because I was working to, um, well, I was supposed to be working to earn money for college. And my sister, my little sister, Libby went home and told my mom, oh, Dave Connors asked Corey if she was going to the young adults conference. <laughs> So mom said, oh, well, maybe you should put off working a week and go ahead and go to the adults conference. <laughs> so I did. And um, and I played guitar and I took my guitar and um, and the girls, the girls at the conference were hanging all over him. And it was like kind of gross, you know, like, yeah, he's a poor guy alone. And so the one of the evenings after the everybody had gone up to their dorm rooms, Dave and I sat in the lobby and played guitar and sang. He played a guitar as well. And, and I just, no, oh, I just, I just started falling in love. And the next night at a dance, uh, another fellow had asked me to save the last dance, which I did. And then David asked me to dance and he kissed my hand and <laughs> it was like, you know, I swooned. It was just, it was, I was so fallen. Then we went home. He went off to BYU law school and I, I never heard from him again, you know, that week. And I thought, well, he must kiss every girl's hand. <laughs> so, then I went out to BYU and when I got there, the, the gal in the dorms had said that two guys had been asking if I was there yet. And I'm oh. like, well, I knew my brother was there. Well, apparently the other guy was Dave. And so he and I were engaged by Thanksgiving and we were married the next June. And um, it, it was, he was a, a beautiful man from the beginning to me and he's still a beautiful man he's kind and smart and faithful and steady he's so steady and i'm so frenetic so he's a he's good for me i would agree that you two complement each other really well really Thanks. really well you and your sisters are just wild and crazy personalities and he's just like you said just steady He's steady. Yeah. yeah you guys complement each other well. Thank so you. let's fast forward. How long have you guys been married? How many children are in the mix? How many grandchildren? Okay. We have, we've been married 46 years. Wow. And, um, four children, one boy, three girls and 11 grandchildren. I am, I'm one of those people who refuses to believe that longevity is like the only marker of success in a marriage. You know, you see somebody who's been married as long as you guys Absolutely. have, and it's easy to jump to the conclusion, wow, you guys have a successful marriage. But I, I want to know what other markers, what other pieces of evidence are there in your marriage that say, you know what, we have something good going. Yeah. No, and I completely agree with you, Shanae. I mean, how many people do you know all of a sudden end up divorced as soon as the children are grown? Yep, it's, it's not that. uncommon. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it's a common thing. And so that cannot be, longevity cannot be the true marker of a successful marriage. And frankly, I don't know if you have, if you know you have a successful marriage until you're done, right? And, until you're both dead, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's a work in progress. It's always a work in progress. Um, in fact, it's the kind of thing that you say, if you say I have a successful marriage, you kind of jinx things, you know, <laughs> in that you can say I have a success. I have a healthy relationship. Mm, okay. Um, I like that. Because successful marriage sets marriage apart as a kind of a thing, you know, like an event. Mm. You know, we have a successful event. 
Mm. And, and a marriage doesn't get to fall into that category. It's, it's a, an, an, a, an organic living kind of breathing thing that is always evolving. I think the word probably the better word would be healthy, relatively healthy Mm -hmm. and everything's relative. But um, I think a a healthy relationship involves, um, and I've been analyzing this lately, um, involves mutual trust, mutual respect, not that you kind of um, live and let live. I don't mean that as respect. I mean, like true respect. It's really hard to give yourself wholly to someone that you don't respect. So to me, that's one of the very first things I would look for. Am I respectable? And do I respect this person? And are they worthy of my respect? Now, if I look at the relationship between my mom and my dad, my dad was unhealthy. Now, as far as his spirit goes, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, When he's free of his addiction, he's probably a wholly different person, but he was not free of his addiction. And so she, she couldn't give him the respect that he would hope for because he wasn't living a life that deserved that respect. Um, And so for her, she may have stayed in it longer than it was healthy for her. I don't know. Trying to make healthy something that doesn't have the potential to be healthy is is a, I I shouldn't say hopeless, but it's a very difficult thing. Yeah. And, And I think the only way you could know whether or not you should try to nurture something that re- that appears to not be able to be made healthy. Um, and that's where my religious faith comes in. I only God can direct me in that way. And because I'm a religious person, that's what, who I would turn to. I don't know what to tell someone that who doesn't have that kind of faith, how they evaluate whether or not a relationship has the hope of one day being healthy. Um, and frankly, I just, I think, um, addiction is one of those categories where it's tough. On the other hand, I have a friend who, who, um, just felt the need to remain supportive and remain in a relationship and he became sober. Wow. And so that's why I say, I can only trust God to lead me on that because he knows more than I know, um, I, I believe he does. And so if the Lord were to say to me, stick, stick with this, then I would need to have the courage to do that. If the Lord said to me in my feelings, you know, and that's how the Lord speaks to me. I don't have any great revelation. I just have repeated feelings and um, little indicators on whether or not that feeling is divinely given. If he were to say to me, you need to, you need to sever this that takes as much courage as sticking with something for, for most people. Um, But it's a God thing for me. I think there's that um, indicate um, successful marriage would be um, curiosity. You both maintain some curiosity about each other. Um, You uh, laugh together. Um, there is something really comforting um, in um, a routine, the routine that you get mm. with, uh, with a relationship. Um, there's a, a, a sweetness and a familiarity with the people we become comfortable with. And so that's a, another indicator of successful m- marriage to me is how comfortable do people appear to be with each other and how, um, happy are they with the routine they have created together? Okay, so so far, you've mentioned respect, which I want to come back to, faith in God, laughing together, staying curious, and having some sort of a routine. 
So as it as it pertains to respect, that one really, really, really struck me. And what I want to ask you is what are some practical things that we can do or maybe stop doing to 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 show respect for our spouses? Oh, that's good. Um, and right, and we can only control ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So it begins with me. So I look at myself and I say, okay, what am I doing that what am I doing that um, makes me less respectful of myself. Okay. And so if I try to create, um, actionable things, you know, things that I do during the day that bug me about myself, well, it may also bug them about me as well. And so we try to, we try to pay attention to what we can, what we can do about ourselves. And I, I try to avoid the word fix, you know, how do I fix myself? Because it's, it, by nature, the word fix means something's broken. And yet we are all broken because no one is perfect. But I just like to go back to the idea of I'm in progress. Mm -hmm. I'm not a thing that was perfect. And then it broke. Um, uh, just like a baby begins with a small egg that that meets with something and makes it something more than it was and then it multiplies and it changes and it morphs and it expands that's how that's me and so i'm not a thing that was perfect and then broke i'm a thing that's evolving mm -hmm. and as i evolve can i evolve into a more respectable thing and if i can have self-respect then i will likely get it from other people it's an interesting mechanism um that's not always the case so a lot of people have self-respect and they are not respected by others and that just has to do with a lot of social flaws that we have as human beings but i try to i try to be respectable myself if something bugs me about myself i will work to to improve it as far as my husband goes, he's just highly respectable. I mean, I lucked out. It was a luck thing. <laughs> On the other hand, because we, we were talking about this last night, you know, why get married? Why even put a seal on it? You know, why don't you just build a relationship? And I told him, um, when I married him, I made a commitment I really made a commitment to three entities. I made a commitment to him that I would be devoted to him and um, love, nurture, and respect him. And that was one of the entities. I made a commitment to our God, who we both love and respect, and that commitment was to God that I would love and respect this man that I was marrying. And then I made a commitment to myself that I would love, nurture, and respect this man. So when this man starts bugging me, and I don't really care for him at the moment, I can hang on to the fact that I made this commitment to God about this man. I can hang on to the fact that I made a commitment to myself that involved this man who's currently irritating me. And those two commitments get me through those moments of irritation. Because trust me, because I'm old now. Well, I'm older. And um, there are times when the person you have married will bug you. And sometimes those, those times are longer than a day or a week or a month, you know, and you, and you expect that they should be getting better and they're not. I really hang on to that commitment I made to those two other people besides that man. So the institution of marriage, which involves commitment besides just to that one person, is a valuable thing because it gets us through the times when it 
we need a little scrubbing out. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember once I, I fell on the way home from school. I, I used to fall all the time. Pittsburgh, there were cinders all over the roads. And so I got cinders in my knees. I still have one cinder in my knee I can feel under my skin from when I was little. Mm-hmm. Well, my mom used to put me in the bathtub, stick a washcloth in my mouth and get the scrub brush and some soap and scrub that raw knee to get those cinders out. Well, I'm thinking she's, she hates me. She, you know, why is she doing this to me? This, she's hurting me. Mm-hmm. And she was scrubbing me out to, to save me from a deeper wounds. And there are times in our marriage when we would say, I, I'm leaving. I'm getting away from this. This doesn't feel good. And for all we know, and I could be wrong, sometimes that's not the case, but many times it's the scrubbing out that's happening and it's going to heal over and it'll be fine. And in the end, we're healthier for it. Mm. You said some really beautiful things. Um, I love the idea of looking at ourselves and our, and our marriages as something in progress. And I think a lot of our frustration, the frustration comes in, the hopelessness comes in when we start looking at our marriage and we say, wait, but we've had this problem before and it's still coming up again. We look at our marriage and we think, why have we not arrived? You know, why aren't we not feeling as happy as we should? Why isn't this marriage producing the fruits that we thought it would? And I think once we can start to look at our marriage as something in progress, then that will lessen our frustration. We'll understand that, okay, there are seasons of of, of difficulties, there are seasons of grief, seasons of financial hardships, whatever it is. There are seasons of not so comfortable things. But once you recognize that, okay, it's just a part of marriage, it doesn't have to last forever. I think that restores our hope in marriage. It restores our hope in ourselves and in, in our spouses. So thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, but on, on the, the topic of hardships, I want to know, whatever you're comfortable sharing, what were some of the the, the, the hardest moments of, of your marriage? First, I'll have to say, we ha- I recognize we have been remarkably blessed. Dave has always been gainfully employed. I have been able to to have a career that does not pay well. And um, because he's able to work and support our family, I can focus on my artistic career and artists in general aren't paid all that well. So uh, we have not had that financial burden, although there have been portions of that uh, when he, he left a, a law practice a, a good law practice as a partner in a law firm and became a judge. He was appointed to be a state court judge and government employees are not paid very well, in, including judges. And uh, it was it was a substantial drop in uh, what we were used to having. Um, even then, it, it, it was not... A hardship. It was just different. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that is one thing I want to note that some things are just different. They're not per, per se hardships. I remember a kid saying t- to me once that I was, I was leading some music in, in church with some kids and a kid was talking about being in pain. And I finally said to him, in real pain, are you, or are you uncomfortable? And he didn't know the difference. And sometimes we think pain is pain and it's just discomfort. And um, it's good to differentiate between the two. So we have never been in intense financial pain. We have had some intense emotional times. I have degrees of um, neurodiversity um, used to be known as, uh, or used to be assumed to be some sort of mental illnesses. I have some, uh, personal issues of depression and, um, 
uh, diagnosed in adulthood with ADHD. And gosh, if I had known when I was little that I had this, I would have been much more gentle with myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I encourage all parents to have their children tested. If they seem a little diverse from the typical, my goodness, go get some tests and figure it out and find out what tools are available and give the kids those tools. So that's, that's beside the point here. I, um, it's, it's mostly, uh, if, if we have marital, a lot based on my, my issues with, um, lack of self love, um, and depression. And we've had periods of that. I have been blessed to be able to understand I need help and medication helps. Uh, counseling has helped. Um, laughter helps. Sunshine helps. Um, I've learned a lot of these things. So if you have a relationship, whether it's parent, child, husband, wife, friends, um, if you have a relationship with someone and, and one of those two people is not healthy, then the mm -hmm. relationship is not healthy. When one of us is cut, all of us bleed. And, um, and so I think a, a lot of the struggle has been that the wife in our relationship has had some struggles and that affects the relationship. I had been uh, the victim of some sexual abuse as a teenager, and that has affected our marriage. Um, it affects me personally. We have not had uh, we have not had infidelity issues. That's a blessing. Mm -hmm. there, that's not to say there has never been temptations for that, or or you wake up in the morning and you've had a dream of someone else, and you think, "What's wrong with me?" <laughs> you know. That's, that's normal. It's yeah. okay. It, you know, it's what we act on that can, can make it a real problem. So, um, you know, when David's mom died, he went through, she died quite tragically in an accident and he went through some, uh, a period of depression himself that was enlightening. And so I don't, I don't feel an anger that any of us have gone through this because the, the process of it has been enlightening to us. It has been humbling. It has bound us to each other. I had a very serious illness where we didn't know if I would live and I can still imagine myself reaching out for his hand oh. and feeling comfort in his touch. And you know, when you have something really serious like that happen, um, and the person that becomes revealed as your person to you, and often that is only through difficulty, it binds you sweetly. Um, and so I am ever grateful for an illness uh, that I survived that told me that this is my person. He's, he's my, um, he's my go-to. He's my comfort. He's the one I want to touch uh, when I'm having a struggle. So sometimes those struggles are great gifts to us. Like I said, they're blurses. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I'm going to have to write that down. So I don't forget. Thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing those experiences. The theme that I see coming out in, in what you're saying is the challenges that we have in marriage. If we choose to, those challenges can bind us together and they can bring us closer together rather than, than, than force us apart. And so for couples, you know, my age or couples, especially in the child rearing stage, we're going to talk about parenting here in a bit, but couples who are struggling right now, what advice do you have for them? 
You know, when you, when you and your, your spouse were younger, going through your difficulties, different mental health issues, what is one thing you wish you had known? I had to interrupt this discussion just, just for a moment to remind you that the mission of Another Day in Love is to help strengthen marriages and families. We believe that we can save families just one marriage, one relationship at a time. And so if this is a mission that you connect with, if this is something that you deem as important to you, then please do us a favor, go ahead and subscribe. And if there is somebody out there who you think may benefit from the discussion that we're having today, please just go ahead and share it with them. But that is it. Keep on watching. I wish I had known when I was younger that, um, that we are just tiny, tiny stones on a mosaic, or at least our life experiences are. And when we're in the middle of it, it looks like the whole picture. And looking back, when you get to be older and you get to look back, you hardly even see the individual stones. You just see the whole mosaic, the whole picture that you didn't know was even a picture, you know, because you're in the middle of it and it seems so big at the moment. And there are, oh, I just, and I see my own kids going through this as parents and as individuals, as adults. And they're, you know, they're just struggling with the, the difficulty and the immediacy of whatever issue they're in the middle of at the moment. And it is big and, and we do need to pay attention to it and address it, but it is not everything. And there will come a time and maybe it's in a thousand years. So not in this realm, there will come a time when you look back at it and you won't even remember that tiny stone that was the whole world to you at the moment, but it does become a part of the big picture. And the picture wouldn't be the same without it. So that it, wow. it, it's not unimportant, but it's not everything. So I wish yeah, I had known, said. just get through it. Just endure. Some things you just endure. Some things we think we need to just endure and we need to just let go a little bit and step back and, and have some fun. Um, and not get so intense about it. You know, I... If I'm, if I'm sweeping the floor constantly because I don't want my kid, my baby that's just learning to crawl, to get a crumb of something that has been, uh, you know, touched by something that was outdoors because I'm afraid they'll get sick, um, I'm going to totally miss the joy of a baby just learning to crawl. Not only that, I'm going to take away the potential of that child building immunity by being exposed to things that are just the world and it's not going to kill them and they'll, yeah. they'll build some immunity. So there's all sorts of reasons for, for not micro focusing on stuff. And we, t we tend to micro focus. That's nature. It's okay. We have to put our energy into what's troubling us and what we have to get through, but you know, realize this too shall pass. This, but it's not, it's not all evil either. It's you, you need the black stones to create contrast for the, the, the beautiful pink ones against the chink bone of your mosaic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we have to have shadow to appreciate light. This, this whole conversation has been very helpful for me because in the thick of it sometimes, in the thick of the, the, the struggles that you go through in life or just the, the, the routine repetitiveness of, of parenting, sometimes you do sweat the, you do sweat the small things. And yeah. it's, it's a good reminder to just, just calm yourself. Calm yourself and understand, just like you said, this too shall pass. And a lot of the things that we stress about right now, here in a few years, we won't even remember them, just like you said. Mm -hmm. And so I think what I, I need to remember is, number one, yes, don't sweat the small things, but don't create a problem where there isn't a problem. Oh, yes. And that's ensure good. that whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it with my husband. We're working together, not against each other. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, talking, staying on track, talking about parenting, the research shows that for a lot of couples, once they become parents, 
they, I think most couples actually, once they become parents, your marital quality declines. Not that there's anything wrong with your marriage, but parenting is tough. So I want to know what was that adjustment like for you guys? You know, welcoming a child into this world, welcoming, how many do you have again? Five? Four. Four, four yeah. children into this world. So what was that like for you and Dave? We, you know, we were going to wait a while um, because I was young. I, we, I was just barely 19 when we got married and, um, and then we couldn't wait. So <laughs> we had, I had Johnny when I was 20 and then I had Sarah on my 22nd birthday. So we had children quite early in our marriage. I, you know, I have to, and David was, at, you know, at the time, uh, finishing l law school and he had a federal clerkship in New York where Sarah was born. And then we moved to Pittsburgh. Um, and he was, you know, a young associate in a, a large law firm and he was having to pay his dues. Right. And so you're having to do all this stuff professionally at the same time for a lot of people as they're experiencing young parenthood at the same time as they're trying to develop a good, healthy relationship with the spouse. It's like a convergence, you know, it's the perfect storm and it, it destroys a lot of people or it strengthens them. For me, I just remembered, I remember driving around Pittsburgh at two in the morning bawling alone because I knew the kids were safe at home with Dave and I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I was a wreck. And I, I really didn't know what was wrong, but I just had so many swirling emotions. And uh, for some reason, it's like a feeling in me said, write down everything you're doing. So I wrote down all I was doing. I mean, how many diapers I was changing a day how long it took to feed the kids, how long it took to nurse the baby. Um, and I looked at this, this list of all this stuff, right? And I had a tenderness toward myself. Um, I looked at myself as if I wasn't myself. And I, and I almost said, oh, you poor girl. No wonder you're tired. No wonder you feel alone. You know, when you're parenting and one spouse is working and one spouse is parenting, or these days more often it's both spouse working, they're coming oh, home yep. exhausted mm -hmm. and trying to build a relationship with their children and trying to nurture and discipline children at the time that they're exhausted and they're still worried about work and mm, hard. All of, There's no way to not do hard. It, it's just hard. It's, it's by nature designed to be difficult. The same way we go to the gym and we use weights to build our muscles. That's what's happening to us. That's what's happening to our souls is these are weights that we're putting on our young spirits and they will build, we will build muscle, but it doesn't come overnight. And um, so when you're young and you're in the middle of it, you think uh, this is unfulfilling. Yeah. And um, I don't like the looks of who I am. I don't like the idea that I'm going to be doing the same thing tomorrow I did today. These children are never going to grow up. I'm always going to be fighting a kid to go to sleep. Oh, you know, whatever it is your issue is, you think it feels like it's forever. It's never going to end, yeah. Yeah. And because it's so slow in ending, if it, it does feel that way, but it does end. And you think the whole time, oh, it's so hard, it's so hard, it's so hard, and then it's almost over, and you think, no, wait, no, wait, I love it. So the the thing, okay, how how do we how do we slow down? How do we slow down? during those years when our children are younger. And it's just, like I said before, just repetitiveness and the constant oh, yeah. fighting with a child. How do you slow down and, and enjoy being a parent? Well, the first thing 
the first thing, the first step of any change is desire. So the first thing you have to have as a, is a desire to slow down. So mm-hmm. you have that desire, you speak that desire. Okay. Either you speak it in your mind or you write it down and um, it be, it, it has a place in your thoughts. You desire it, you speak it, you, you give it place. And then you, you repeat that repetition of it. Our instincts tell us what to do because no one's going to give you a pattern on what to do because your pattern, your routine is completely different than anyone else's. It really is. You think it's the same, but it's really different because there are all the components are different. There, there are major little things that are the same, but, but so the only way you can do it is with your own. You have to you have to create your own custom pattern. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and if you so if you if you desire it, speak it, repeat it, it will find a place in your thinking, and your actions will respond to your thoughts. Um, I I I'm not so good at it now, but when I was younger, I kept a journal, and uh, that. Well, I, yeah, the keeping of a journal, I, I think, is a healthy routine. It, uh, it helps us pause and ponder and look back and look introspectively at ourselves. I had a, a tiny little journal of funny things my kid did, my kids did. And it was just a very small little thing. But when somebody said something funny or did something funny, I wrote it in that little journal. And what happens when you have a, a little book like that to journal, you start looking for things to be grateful for just by nature mm-hmm. because of the journal. So I'm kind of a fan of, of, of journaling in that it causes us to um, put ourselves into the, the mind of a, of a poet who sees things with a more poetic eye than a, a pragmatic eye. And life is always more charming if it's looked at poetically than if it's looked at pragmatically. So when I'm when I say I'm going to write something, I start living a day with somewhere in the back of my head the thought that I'm going to be writing about it. Strangely. And um and in order for, for your body to believe you, you just have to write. So if yeah. you were to write every night a little bit about that day, then um, you would face the day differently. So I think one way to, to change that is to, to journal. One of the things I, one of the themes I hear coming out of this is you have to, like you said, you have to desire it. So that, that change to, to slowing down and enjoying our children it starts with the heart and the mind. You have to, you have to have that desire. I think a lot of us fall into the fall into the trap of thinking, you know, when my when my kids are older, I'll see the returns. When they are all grown up and they're well adjusted individuals out there in society doing their thing, starting their own families, then I'll see the returns and I can finally just breathe. But I I don't think God designed it for us to just wish our days away, just waiting for our kids to grow up. Because then we're going to look back and miss it. We're going to look back with all these regrets. Oh, so, not only that, but they when they grow up, it's not over. <laughs> you know, true, they're, true. They're, they're still, you know, they still struggle and they still need their parents. And um, in a different way, you know, you're not you're not parenting in the same way, but the, you still have a vested interest in that being. And it, that doesn't go away. It doesn't end. Once a parent, always a parent. So there's no, there's no final moment like, okay, they're raised, I'm done. That's important to know. You know, once since since we understand that once a parent, always a parent, then yeah. might as well you just start trying your best to enjoy it. No. It's right? absolutely the truth. That is absolutely yeah. the truth. Yeah. Okay. So as a, as a stay-at-home mom, I have friends as well who are stay-at-home moms and the struggle is real. We struggle on a daily. And I want to know as a stay at home mom, 
what was helpful for you or what could have been helpful for you. For me, I think my biggest struggle stems from the lack of familial support. My husband and I, we live, you know, miles and miles away from our closest family members. And so we don't have that ongoing daily or even weekly support. So for you, what was helpful or could have been helpful as a stay-at-home mom? What was helpful? I have been fortunate in that I haven't got overly sucked into the need to compare myself to other moms. And maybe I'm, you know, deluding. I mean, maybe I, I, I'm under delusion that I didn't compare myself and I, we all compare ourselves, but it is such a slippery slope when we start looking at ourselves and looking at other people and seeing how we stack up. Um, I, I was not, a, um, I was not an overly nurturing mother in that I, you know, I didn't get up and make breakfast for the kids. Um, we did not have steady bedtimes. We were, we were a fairly undisciplined family. In fact, people, people, I remember going through a period where people were, where we wanted to read scriptures in our family. Everybody was doing theirs in the morning before school. And so we tried that and we can't, we just can't get up. We're taught, we're tired in the morning. We're just not real disciplined people. And then we tried in the evening before dinner, but nobody was ever home at the same time. We have really kind of frenetic lives. We found for our family that the time that was best for us was 11 o'clock at night. And we're talking kids. Listen to that. <laughs> in your high late elementary school. I mean, that's late, right? That is late. If if you were to say that to the neighborhood, they'd say like, what? Your kids should be sound asleep by 11 o'clock. Well, my kids weren't. And we found that that was the only time that we were actually together and the house was semi, you know, dependably to, there and maybe a little quiet. And so we started reading like 11 at night before they went to bed and it was awesome. It worked great for us. And so I, I guess, you know, for, for, for moms who are, whose home is their realm, their home is their workspace. Um, first of all, that's rough because you don't ever get to escape it. Right. But it's also beautiful. Um, because it is, it kind of is your domain, but read your own domain, figure out your own family. If your family does something a certain way and it doesn't, it's not the same way the rest of the neighborhood would do it. So what, if what works for you works for you and, uh, and make it work for you. If it's going to be good for your family, make it work and quit looking at other people. Frankly, I would I would not write songs if I had to have a clean house all the time. I have to be able to sit down in a mess if the inspiration comes and the 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 feeling comes that I'm supposed to write. I just have to ignore everything else and do it mm -hmm. or it would never happen. So I've been blessed to be to be able to live with a kind of a mess. And it frees my time up for all sorts of other stuff. And I have the added blessing that I have a spouse who understands that about me. I think he would prefer to have things organized and tidy. I think by nature that would be better for him, but he he has never complained. He is he is the epitome epitome of kindness. He just does not say negative things to me. Yeah. And if, if you go through 45 years of someone not criticizing you, it affects you in a beautiful way. Yeah. So um, first of all, don't be critical of yourself. Don't be critical of each other. A lot of don'ts, huh? Do embrace the mess. And if you are an artist, do your art. And by that, I mean 
writing, painting, crafting, whatever it is, allow a place for that. I have a daughter who's a doctor. She's a mother of four kids. She has a, a college degree in fine art. She's a beautiful painter. And she hasn't painted in a couple of years. And it and it breaks my heart. Yeah. I I want her to, I want her to forgive herself of any mess she has and pick up a paintbrush. Um and I taught myself that early on that I if if I could not resist my guitar, I picked it up. And I it didn't overcome the I, I didn't neglect my kids. I didn't neglect the nurture that was necessary. But I may not have had a pristine house. And I'd rather have a collection of songs that speak of who I am than a house that in a hundred years no one will know whether or not it was. The the two messages that I, I got from what you said is oh nobody can see me. Number one is don't waste your time comparing yourself to others. Figure out what works for you and what works for your family. And right. don't exhaust yourself trying to do it how the lady next door does it. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. And then number two, make sure that you are feeding your soul. You're filling your cup with what it is. Like you said, if you're an artist, you do something, pay mus play music, paint, whatever. But just making sure that you're doing something for you to nurture your spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think... That's wonderful advice. Just to wrap things up, I want to start a little tradition every time I have a guest where I have them say one word or one phrase that comes to mind when they think of love within the context of marriage. What is one word or one phrase that comes to mind? Um, today, and it might yeah. be different okay, tomorrow, today, today uh -huh. for me is respect. Okay. Well, on that note, we'll wrap things up. I want to thank every single person who has spent the time to watch this podcast to the end. Thank you for being here. I do hope that Corey's wisdom and her stories and her experiences, that they will make a, a difference in your life, that they will help you to appreciate your spouse a little bit more, appreciate your marriage a little bit more, and put in the work where the work is needed. So that's it for today's episode. Until next time, remember to live a good life.